All right, the recording is going. So good morning and welcome back to Going Public, Opening Scholarship for All. For our next session, I'm pleased to introduce Nagina Gossibaik. Um, Nagina is a data visualization librarian at the University of Washington. In this role, she helps students, faculty, researchers, and staff think critically about and create data visualizations. She is interested in the intersections of data and equity. Nagin's talk today is entitled Equity in Data Visualization. At this time, I'll turn it over to Nagin. Thanks, Madeline. Um, and thank you all for coming here today. I really appreciate it. Um, and just in advance, I've had a little bit of a cough, so I'm sorry if I'm muting myself a little bit here and there, but hopefully we'll get through it pretty smoothly. So um, before I really get into it, I just kind of want to take a minute and talk about how I've gotten here to this point. Um, so in graduate school, I was around a lot of um, data scientists and got to see firsthand some of the ways that they handled data, um, and I had some concerns grow um, from that and how data was structured and visualized and shared. Um, and that sort of led me to think more about where data and social justice intersect, and from there, some of the fundamental problems um, that can come from it. Um, so, you know, data is often assumed to be objective or neutral or um, distant, um, but still vital in research and scholarship. Um, and, you know, how can something that seems so straightforward um, be problematic? Um, but what I keep coming back to is that data is fundamentally um, created by and about people, um, whether you're in the humanities or the health sciences or in information studies. Um, it's about people or it's about things that will um, impact people in some way. And I think that can be a little bit easy to forget um, when some of the data that we work with is abstracted on several levels from you know, the people who constructed the parameters and from the people who are contributing information, their own data. Um, and even when we talk about data and oversimplify data by, um, cleaning it or tidying it, wrangling it, normalizing it, um, we're oversimplifying and devaluing the complex identities who share their data with us, whether they do it willingly or not. Um, and even those terms cleaning and normalizing sort of assume a, a sort of messiness that needs to be um, categorized or controlled in some way. And I think um, this quote by Giorgio Lupi, who is uh, one half of um, the Dear Data series, um, which is essentially where, uh, which was a sort of series where um, two people sent back and forth uh, weekly visualizations on postcards, all hand drawn. Um, I recommend you check it out. Um, but I think this quote really captures this idea. And she says that data represents real life. It is a snapshot of the world in the same way that a picture captures a small moment in time. Numbers are always placeholders for something else, a way to capture a point of view, but sometimes this can get lost. Um, failing to represent these limitations and nuances and blindly putting numbers in a chart is like reviewing a movie by analyzing the chemical properties of the cellulose on a, which those images were recorded. Um, and I, I really like that piece. Um, numbers are always a placeholder for something else. But I think in a lot of cases, numbers are a placeholder for someone else as well. Um, so I think another thing that I've heard now more frequently being a librarian um, is that some people don't work with data at all in their lives or in their scholarship. Um, but I think data collection creeps in in ways that are hard to recognize sometimes. So if you're involved in um, scholarship or if you're at an institution or um, you know you sort of you use any services that collect data, um, you're involved in data in some context. You're involved in um, either the collection of that data or finding that data or if your data is being collected. Um, so in some ways you're probably um, exposed to one of those pieces. Um, and this on the slide here is not a comprehensive list at all, um, but it's just some of the types of data that aren't always as obvious when we think about data and what data is. So, um, and I'm just curious um, from the audience, if you feel comfortable sharing um, in chat maybe um, 
what are some of the types of data that you use um, or interact with or contribute to? Um, if you want to share it, uh, go ahead and write it in the chat and I can just take a couple seconds to do that, um, especially if it's data that you think isn't as typical. Um, some of the other examples, yeah, photographs, thanks, that's a really great one. Um, photographs is another really great example. Interviews, yeah, um, for sure. Um, that's another good one. Uh, transcripts, um, there are all these different types of data, student work or um, analytics, learning analytics, uh, Canvas software. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for this. Um, they're great examples. Um, and uh, I think, again, in some ways, we're all involved in this. And as a result, I think we all have some degree of responsibility um, for how we use and share the data that we work with in all of our everyday life. So thank you all so much. Um, but before we even touch data visualization, I think it's key to touch on this other fundamental piece, which is data structures. Um, and when I use the term data structures, I'm referring to how we shape the systems that we use to gather and analyze data. Um, so this is you know, not a really new concept, but when we look at the creators um, and shapers of data science, uh, you might notice that a lot of them are white men. Um, and from there, it's not a huge stretch to say that the concepts in data science and visualization that they've shared and constructed are um, from their own positionality and from their own positions and are sort of white by default. Um, just because of their identities. And, um, you know, this concept isn't new. Uh, it exists in some areas of critical data studies and digital humanities already. Um, and another piece that I want to consider is the difference between quantitative, qualitative, and other forms of data. So I don't want to get too much into this, um, but I think some of the issues that I'll be talking about more are found probably more in quantitative and big data. And, I'm, and there are several reasons for this. Um, but one thing that I think uh, is uh, really important um, as to why this is, is um, this concept, this idea of efficiency. Um, Quantitative data can be faster um, and possibly easier to analyze than other types of data, but with the computational strength of our machines and the fact that there are a limited range of values that can exist within each variable. So um, that's just something that I'm thinking about when I'm talking about um, this, the, when I'm talking about sort of the problems in data. Um, and now I want to kind of move over and think about individual identities and how they fit into data structures um, and the ways that these structures that have been set up to sort of default all pieces of an identity into these um, white, often ableist, cis, um, and so on identities, right? Um, and so here are some examples of this. Um, so first, I kind of want to look at how we think about racial data in America um, and in our institutions, right? So. Um, according to the U.S. government, there is like maybe four or five categories um, on race, a uh, category for two or more races, which they usually don't care what two or more races, they're just interested in that piece. Um, and then sometimes there's another category. Um, but given the complexity of the world, it's really hard for me to imagine why four to five categories um, and buckets of race are sort of sufficient to capture the full identities of people. Um, and I think this oversimplification of racial data makes it really easy for um, computers to process and for analyzers to make comparisons and for those in powers to make decisions based on the supposedly objective data. Um, where there are no other answers and everything fits really cleanly into these categories. Um, but I think what this does instead is that it fails to recognize the full depth of the individual histories and identities. Um, and in a sense, I think it's a way that we whiten identities. Um, and when we do that, we make decisions about them based on what's convenient or necessary for analysis. Um, and the people in the data who are actually contributing to the data um, have their significance wiped away in our analysis and in our interpretation. So um, 
Abigail Echo Hawk um, from the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is one of 12 tribal epidemiology centers in the United States says, um, we're always being shown as statistically insignificant. Um, and then she goes on to say that one of the ways that there is continuing genocide against American Indians slash Alaska natives is through data. When we are invisible in the data, we no longer exist. When I see an asterisk that says not statistically significant, or they lump us together with Pacific Islanders and Asian Americans, you can't lump racial groups together. That is bad data practice. Um, and I, I think uh, there's an, oops, I've gone back. Um, and I think there's another um, area that we can look at where something kind of similar happens, um, which is gender. Um, we run into the same issues where we have male, female, and increasingly, though definitely not ubiquitously, um, an other category now. Um, and the other category attempts to capture gender identities existing outside of binary structures um, that attempt to dominate our systems. Um, though it is literally and in practice othering of non-binary identities, the data structures that exist um, were not really developed to capture anything beyond the binary things that exist right now that we're using. So um, when we're looking at data we've collected ourselves or historical data that we're analyzing, it's just important to keep in mind um, how the data has been structured. So things that seem straightforward and objective could actually be misrepresentative, oversimplified, and potentially harmful. So building on Abigail Echohawk's point from before, uh, simplifying data by nature makes it really difficult to address intersections of identities in a meaningful way unless we are actively working towards it. So everything about me and who I am is put into like a box of some sort, right? So um, my race or one of the few categories of race that exist at least, or um, my ethnicity, uh, whether or not I'm the first person in my family to go to college, my gender, if I'm a US citizen, um, and I'm all these other sort of data points that somehow describe and make up a full person. Um, and I think, again, quantitative data is at particular risk because of these issues. Um, there are just a limited number of ways that we can communicate our thoughts, our identities, and our feelings through like radio buttons and check marks. Um, and what all of this does is take individuals and break them up into pieces and push them into categories that are white by default, but easier for us to process and for computers to process. Um, but on the other hand, qualitative methodologies, which I will admit are not always perfect and definitely have their own problems, um, result in data that is more significantly, that is usually significantly more time consuming to analyze, but gives a lot of space for complexity and um, for the full identities of people to be present in that data. Um, that being said, I don't think that all quantitative data is bad. Um, and, you know, it can help us identify patterns and connections um, that we might not otherwise be able to recognize. But I think a little bit too often, it's an inadequate symbol that is taken to represent complexity in a way that a computer can process efficiently, but isn't true to um, who people are. So here's another um, example of, sort of a more concrete example of why the construction of our data is so important. So I just created this random person, student A, um, who fills out a survey uh, in the US that asks some basic demographic questions, right? Um, and based on the data that they provide, um, we conclude that they are white and that they are not a first generation college student. Um, and this is, again, based on the sort of limited structures that we've developed to gather this information. So um, just take a second and think about some of the assumptions and narratives you might already have about the student that we're looking at. But then what happens if we give student A the option to fill in their response as a short answer? Um, I think our identity of them here really changes, right? We find out that they do not really self-identify as white, but rather as Iranian, um, specifying that they're ethnically Persian and Afro-Iranian. Um, we also learned that one of their parents completed school up to a seventh grade le level, and that their other parent had a degree er back home um, that was not accepted in the US when they came, and that they therefore had to restart school when student eight was in their teens. 
Um, so, you know, now let's go back and revisit those assumptions from back here. Um, you kind of get a very different understanding of who the student is and sort of their background and their needs and um, their histories and identity, right? So um, the other pieces though, neither of these are wrong, so to speak, right? So according to the United States, um, student A is white because they're of Middle Eastern origin, whatever Middle Eastern means. Um, and technically they weren't the first in their fam immediate family at least to go to college of some sort. Though now that we look at it, it seems like the um, parent who had gone to college had gone back home and maybe weren't as familiar with the systems in the United States perhaps. Maybe that's an assumption that we're making too, but um, it leads us to ask a little bit, a few more questions about it. Um, and let's say, okay, we'll just like expand our categories. And I think a good example of this is Statistics Canada, um, which has like hundreds of categories. Um, we're more in depth, um, but still quantitative. It's easy enough for a computer to process. But when we compare these three together, we can see that the ability for these data structures to um, capture an identity fully are really far from each other in terms of robustness, right? So if this data is being used to try to promote equity and social justice or, um, or make decisions about uh, support to provide, uh, you can see where some people might fall through the cracks. Um, and this is just one example out of many that, uh, can show up like this. So um, more importantly, maybe we have to think about how this could potentially harm someone. So what what is it like to provide data into structures where you're diluted or whitened or forced into a binary where you might feel that way? And what does it say to those who provide this data willingly or unwillingly? Um, and then from there, what about when decisions are made for these individuals based on this very limited obviously oversimplified data. Um, this is where I think oversimplifications move from being a problem with the data to being harmful to individuals. So really my question is how can we center equity when the decisions we make from the data that we gather, find, or use are potentially harmful? Um, so I know that we're not always designing our own data collection instruments and gathering our own data, but you know it's just someone that's gathered it for us, or maybe it's um, city data, uh, government data, uh, someone else has designed and shaped it. But I think in this case, there's still a way to try to capture a fuller understanding of um, the people involved in the data set. So I think one of the ways we can do this is to customize our data sets by pulling in multiple ones that include primary, secondary, non-Western sources, and so on, and really use them to evaluate um, the data, shape the data, and explain your own custom data set. Um, and linking, of course, linking back to sources is also always important, um, but I think also creating a guide for the limitations in the data and thinking about what other sources to consider is also really important. Um, so, there's one example that I think does this really well, uh, which is pretty popular. So I'm sorry if you've already seen this um, and learned about it, but it's the map of um, white supremacy mob violence, um, which is a part of the Monroe Work Today project. Um, one key piece of this digital product is that they have a section that links from the map itself and leads to other pages um, that ask questions and look more critically at the data and the decisions that have been made around the data. Um, and really, I think this is a great example of being transparent and open about data, um, which can help in looking at social justice, which can help in looking at equity um, and being really clear about the decisions that we make and why we make them. Um, so, you know, this is one really great example, but I can't pretend that I have all the solutions for this or really any um, all encompassing solutions. Um, but I do think there are some steps that we can take to help improve this. So um, first, um, working to gather and use more qualitative data in our work um, where we can, which can allow for more complexity, though again, not a perfect solution. Um, and then if we want to center equity, we have to devalue this efficiency that I think is tied so strongly to quantitative data um, and make time and space for this complexity. We can also do a better job of foregrounding our background and context um, 
when we are approaching the data. Um, also, when we do set up our data collection instruments and structures, um, we can make space for individual identities as best as we can. So for those two examples of racial and gender data, one approach would be to change the response to short answer rather than pre-selected options. Um, again, does this slow down the analysis and processing of the data? Yes, for sure. Um, but it also keeps us from dividing identities into categories that are determined by sort of these white whitened structures. And you know, if we use any of this data for decision making, it's also important to be sure that those who are included in the data are represented as fully as possible. Um, and even on a policy level, when producing scholarship and contributing to an area of knowledge, it's possible to develop data policies that really do center equity and openness um, and going public and um, bring that to the forefront and prioritize those things. Um, ultimately, we need to change systems and not people. Uh, this is a fundamental concept that I think is important to carry throughout this work. Um, and again, another way to be open and transparent is to share data, not just data, actually, like, but like methodologies, um, reasons for decisions and how data has been cleaned. So you know, at the end of this piece, um, I kind of want to, I encourage um, minimizing how much data is collected in the first place. Um, we don't need to prove that institutional racism exists, right? We don't need to prove that transphobia or systemic inequities, ableism, and other forms of um, oppression and hate and structures exist because we understand that they exist. But instead, um, thinking when you're um, setting up your data collection processes or structures, um, thinking more about what are some approaches that you can take to approach these forms of repression and really center equity instead. So another piece directly related to equity and going public is sharing data. Um, and I think in order for us to think about sharing data, it's important, at least for me, to think about data as having power. You know, if you have data, you have some power, you have some information, you have some knowledge about something. Um, and I think if we can accept that having data is power, then I think sharing data is really key to sharing power. So there are some really straightforward um, or maybe familiar reasons you've heard for sharing data, which are you know, transparency um, and to allow for feedback and peer review on scholarship. And I don't mean to devalue these things at all because they really are incredibly important to equity and scholarship and openness and research. Um, but I think there are other subtle or, um, but also really important um, reasons for sharing data too. So um, one reason is that by sharing data, those who have contributed to your data, whether they're individuals, um, groups or identities, they have access to the data that you've collected that is ultimately about them um, and belongs to them. And I won't get too much into data sovereignty, um, partially because of time, but uh, to be quite frank, uh, largely because I'm still learning a lot about it and don't know enough about it to talk about it. Um, but I think this concept is important in thinking about who gives information and who gives pieces of themselves and who manages and holds that information. Um, which are not always, actually probably not often the same groups. Um, and it's really helped me think about power sharing and power dynamics in some new ways. Um, also, another piece of sharing data is that it's an opportunity to acknowledge um, the, or even discover the limitations and potential flaws of that data, which can be really intimidating, but I think is really an important part of centering equity, um, acknowledging problems, and being transparent in, scholarships, in scholarship. And I think what I really want to pull out explicitly is that it's not sufficient to just share the data, but again, how have you shaped it, how have you interpreted it, and how have you cleaned it and visualized it. Um, so in thinking about what this might look like, I've pulled some really, really specific um, examples, but I don't think that these apply to every case for sure. I just think it might be more helpful to have some concrete ideas of what this could potentially look like. So um, one thing that is possible is to share code with context. If you have any code with your data, associated with your data, whether it's in the cleaning or analysis or visualizing, um, to share it with the context and the reasons for your decisions and limitations of that. Um, the other piece is to share conclusions gathered from 
data collection first with the communities who will feel the impacts of it before sharing more widely. And then if you can include community participants in each part of the process without exploitation, with compensation. Um, and also, uh, I feel like I um, would uh, not forgive myself if I forgot to mention this as a librarian, but to be sure you can, you put your data or publications in an open access repository if possible. Um, and again, sharing how you've changed the data as well is really important. Um, and another way that we share data is through visualization. So uh, I think there is a lot to think about when we look at data visualization and equity. And I'm just going to touch on a few pieces of this topic um, and also acknowledge again that I'm still growing and learning more about this area. Uh, so I always welcome feedback. Um, one key part of data visualization and equity is the actual tool that's used in scholarship and sharing of that work. So and thinking about going public with, with visualization, and whether or not we're centering equity when we do that, it's important to think about some different pieces when we select a tool. So is the tool open source or is it a proprietary tool? Um, can anyone reproduce your work? Um, can anyone look at your work and see what decisions you've made um, and how you've represented the data? Or is it all just kept in some big tech black box where none of this information is accessible and going public with your data is limited to only those who are privileged enough to access those tools? And I won't really talk about any specific tools here. There's just too many to cover. Um, but there are definitely um, data visualization tools available that can help scholarship go public in a way that's more, um, more accessible. Um, the other piece is the learning curve required to use these tools, and this includes you know, both, uh, this is both in terms of the creation of visualization and also the consumption of visualizations on the user end. So some of these tools require a high level of coding and programming knowledge in order to develop them and even to use them sometimes. Um, whereas others are created more to align with interfaces that are intuitive or user friendly or familiar. Um, and so really the question that I usually try to ask myself um, in, thinking about data visualization is, is the goal to share scholarship and data or is it to teach a tool? Um, and that's not to say that there aren't times when a tool with a higher learning curve or something that's proprietary isn't the most appropriate tool. But I think, again, it's important just to consider this, um, who's the audience and who has access to this information? Um, is this, is equity um, and access a priority of this project, um, or are there other priorities that come into play? And I don't think the answer is, you know, only use tools that are open and built to be intuitive, but rather that when you're thinking about these projects, when you're thinking about going public with your work, um, it's important to think about, um, you know, accessibility of the tools and also the learning curve. Um, I also personally put a lot of value into hand-drawn visualization. So I think it makes data visualization accessible, not only in terms of being able to see and interpret the visualization, but also in terms of making data visualization less intimidating, you know, while still communicating that really important information. So um, I really appreciate this visualization by Mona Chalabi about average voter wait times. She might have seen, I think made the rounds of a while ago. Um, if you look up um, Chalabi's Twitter, you can also find more information and other really cool visualizations like this. Um, the Dear Data series that I mentioned a little bit earlier is also composed of hand-drawn visualizations. Um, but getting back to this, I really appreciate how you can look at the visualization, understand the point of it, um, understand um, the what the um, author, the artist really is saying um, without needing to download a tool without needing to learn how to read specific types of charts. Um, and um, really all you need here is paper, pencil, um, and you can produce something um, through that medium that is still really impactful um, and that is open. And um, I, I made my own attempt at drawing a visualization. It's personal to my life. Uh, and it documents how difficult it was for me to get up for work after a two-week break. Um, it's definitely not the best visualization in the world. Um, I'm definitely not the best artist in the world. Um, but again, it's accessible. It took a couple of minutes and I made it on the back of a business card. Um, and again, this is an attempt to sort of center equity in data visualization, tools that a lot of people have access to that you don't need a computer for, but it's still personal and relevant to individual lives. Um, what I call this specific visualization scholarship, not so much, but I don't think it's too difficult to imagine how this could translate to research and scholarship in some ways. 
And another piece is accessibility, which I'm going to get to soon. But first, I'm going to jump over to context. Um, you know, what is the context of the data? What is the context of the audience? What is the impact of the audience? And there are some really straightforward ways to provide context when creating sharing visualizations. I mean, we've talked, I've talked about this probably too many times now, but linking back to the data source, providing context, thinking about individuals um, and not groups, uh, or individual people and not necessarily groups, um, recognizing that it's individuals who have contributed to um, your data, whether or not you collected the data or just using someone else's collection of the data, um, but just how the way that the data is visualized and contextualized and disseminated can really have an impact on those individuals. So I want to go back to um, the mob violence visualization again, because I think it does a good job of providing context and being transparent, but also uh, recognizing the individuals who are part of this data set. So if you hover over this point, over these points, and this isn't interactive, but um, I, I, you know, you're, I welcome you to pull it up and look along with me. Um, you can actually get more information about the individuals. So obviously, this uh, point really applies in only specific contexts. You don't want to share anything that's dangerous, um, if identifiable or is confidential. Um, but what I think the value of this is. Um, is that it brings into view the fuller identity of those who are impacted by this violence, right? So um, rather than a statistic, it's a person. Um, and I have to admit, I have some mixed feelings about this point, um, but I think it's one of those cases where context is really important to the way that you go with this. And I think also in terms, in the attempt to really provide um, more context and center equity, it's important to rethink data visualization best practices. Um, one that I think that aligns with some of our aesthetics is this idea of minimalism, so minimal text, minimal ink on the page. Um, but I think a lot of these best practices are not really built for accessibility, um, where more explanatory or guiding text could be more helpful for, say, a screen reader or someone who's not as familiar with that area of scholarship. Um, so instead of focusing on best practices that don't prioritize accessibility, I think it's really important to reconsider um, what would be the best structure, um, the best um, organization, the best colors um, of your visualizations and reinvent them to center equity and accessibility. Um, and that's actually something I'm kind of working on right now. I'm always working on this. I actually don't think I'll ever be done working with on this, but um, that is definitely something that I, I've been reconsidering um, and thinking through what are the best practices and why are the, they the best practices and who created these best practices. And um, most of the best practices have been developed by those who also created those data structures we talked about at the beginning. So um, that has just been a growing concern, um, an area that I've been interested in for a while. So I hope this was useful um, to think about some points when working with and visualizing data, um, going public with data where it feels, you know, at least to me, um, really important when considering access and equity. Um, and all of these components really build up to push us to center equity. Um, I know this was a lot of information, but I'm always learning and shaping my views. Um, I definitely don't claim to know everything on this topic or even close to everything on this topic. Um, but I really would love it if you want to talk more, if you have thoughts about it, to put it in the chat or in the questions right now, or feel free to email me and I'm always happy to talk. So thank you. All right, this is Robin, again, one of the moderators for uh, this panel. Thank you so much, Nagin. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation and lots of really um, compelling, dynamic, and difficult questions that you raised for us. Um, we had a lot of questions come in, so I'm going to try and get to as many as we can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, a question that came in uh, a bit earlier about the limitations that come uh, that have to do with quantitative data collection. It says, I wonder uh, how much of these limitations come from the nature of quantitative data collection and the white cis male perspective that determines how to utilize the data. What are some of the ways that we can combat both of these issues? Yeah, and I think like both of those pieces are just so fundamentally a part of um, a part of this problem. And I, 
again, don't know that I have um, the best answer or all of the, all of the answers for this, but um, one of the ways that I think can help us start is to think more about qualitative um, methodologies where we might use quantitative. Um, and I say this not knowing really the exact implications of it and really not necessarily um, thinking uh, about well, not necessarily not thinking about it, but just being aware that there are issues when it comes to implementing those methodologies, methodologies over quantitative methodologies. Um, but I think it's a step that uh, we could experiment with. You know, if ethnographic studies have been happening, and again, problematic in some of their own ways, but I think might be a way to start um, moving past just um, select limited structures um, that quantitative data kind of facilitates and moving into more um, qualitative human, humanistic, human-centered um, uh, approaches. So I don't know, I'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question fully. The truth is I'm still trying to figure that out too. I think that's very fair, Nagin. I don't think we can expect um, that of you, but I appreciate it. Um, Elliot writes in with a question that brings this to the point of our current moment with coronavirus. He writes, in the context of coronavirus, have you seen any particularly concerning examples of data sharing uh, or perhaps ethical examples of sharing? Yeah, uh, I think this, I, I think what I've noticed is after some big event, um, whether it's coronavirus or if it's, you know, the mass shooting in El Paso or a school shooting, there's a, sort of this like flurry of um, data and, and visualizations that are created. Um, and I think uh, one of the, there, there's a lot to talk about there, but I think one of the important pieces is that, you know, the data that is shared um, impacts human beings, right? It impacts human beings at a moment of trauma and a moment of crisis. Um, and uh, that for me is something that I think about when considering sort of the ethical implications of creating data visualizations is, you know, I'm building, you know, if someone builds, um, for example, a visualization of, you know, the number of school shootings or how many people, students have died in school shootings or something, right? Um, and when it's just occurred, how does that impact the person who's viewing it on the other end? Um, and that's not even to, that's not even approaching sort of the larger issues of um, misinformation, which we've talked about, or, um, you know, data that's currently being gathered that might not be um, verified, that might not be as accurate. So there are all these pieces that come into play um, when we have something big that, um, that affects us like coronavirus that I think are just really important to think about. So thanks. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Joe who writes, in Canadian arts journalism, there seems to be a movement where writers self-identify at the beginning or end of their articles, for example, stating their cultural background or their family's immigration history, whether they are settler or indigenous. And Drew writes, I wonder if scientists or humanities researchers ever do this in a way to reveal potential inherent biases in the data or research method. Curious to hear your thoughts on this as one possible way to further, um, and in quotes, center equity in data. I'm uh, glad you brought that up because I um, think that in term, it, like when sharing, disseminating scholarship or creating visualizations, um, it, I think it is really crucial to do some of that if you are comfortable doing that, right? So I um, would, wouldn't would want to necessarily ask anyone to do that, but I think um, if someone is comfortable sharing that and comfortable sharing sort of where their position is and how, what lens they they have, um, and that is constructed for them to be looking at these issues, to be looking at the data or the work that they're doing is important. And I think, again, I come, keep coming back to this sort of quantitative qualitative, but I think um, there's more of a history of doing that um, and explaining your position um, in qualitative practices in a way that there ne isn't necessarily with um, you know, quantitative or like big data practices. So um, I, and honestly still trying to work on doing that and thinking about the best ways to do that personally. But I think, you know, through doing it, it's been a really eye-opening experience to think about how I, how I personally, um, how I personally um, view data and shape data myself. So I hope that sort of helps answer that question. <laughs> 
Great, Nagin. And we, st we still have more questions coming in. Um, so we'll try and get to, again, as many as we can. Um, Elaine in the chat uh, put in a question. She mentioned that you've already spoken to uh, about racism, sexism, and ableism that shape institutions. So I'm putting, putting those points to the side for a minute. Um, Elaine writes, my wonder is how do we not address the classism that institutions were built upon and continue to perpetuate? This is not at the forefront of conversations. So any comments about that? Yeah, I um, am personally very interested in this too because of, uh, you know, just personal experiences and in coming into academia and so, um, and coming into, an, uh, you know, large institution. Um, and I will be honest and say that I honestly am not really sure necessarily how to do this. I mean, I think addressing it in a way, uh, addressing it can be so much more complicated than the ways that we address other issues like racism or sexism and ableism, um, because it almost seems that it's uh, harder to pinpoint sort of those, those categories or those buckets that might help help us have those conversations but I think again like in when when approaching a project that is about people that is about um, institutions um, I think uh, making space for those types of conversations in your research or in your interviews or in your uh, surveys is just a way to um, address that and I I really, I have to like, again, just be really honest and say that I don't know the best way to address it. Um, but I do recognize that it is an, it is an issue, um, especially in institutions. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Again, I, I think this is really great to just even to surface these as part of the value. So, so thank you, Nagin. We really value your perspective and thank you audience members for these great questions. Um, we had a couple more come in. And I think we have time to at least get to the two of them. Um, so another question that just came in, um, both of these questions are going to point a little bit to some larger data companies or companies in general that do data collection. The first one has to do with um, Tableau. It's Elliot who writes, do you know if data scientists are putting pressure on companies like Tableau to make their platforms more accessible to disabled people? So do you know anything about the state of that? Yeah, uh, so I don't know exactly who it is who's putting on the pressure. I don't know if it's data scientists. My gut says probably not, but um, I think Tableau now has, um, companies like Tableau now have users that are outside of just like industry um, and like business. Um, and I think there is this increasing pressure uh, from large institutions maybe from the UW, I don't know from the UW, but uh, you know, uh, public institutions in particular who have to meet um, uh, compliance and have to meet certain um, sort of legal standards. Um, and I have seen um, over the few years that I've used Tableau personally, that there have been some improvements that have been made. Um, so um, for example, like just I think in the very recent um, version that they released that you can now add alt text to images um, and Microsoft Power BI for example also allows you to add alt text to images and um, that's at least for me new um, and there are more videos and more support pages um, ad addressing accessibility um, and uh, so I think it's becoming more of an issue as their user base is growing but um, I don't work with Tableau very closely, I don't, you know, I don't know the people there. So I honestly don't know who's putting on the pressure or why they're making these decisions, but I am glad that they are at least working toward it. Great, thank you so much, Nagin. Uh, one more question, this one right now from Ashley, um, who has also given a lot of really great comments in the chat. So I encourage those of you who've been following along to scroll back and look at that. And Ashley writes, do you have any thoughts on how data collection, this is thinking of like data centers specifically, and big tech are also tied to neocolonialism in today's society? Data centers that are water intensive, our societal reliance uh, in the global north on fancy technologies perpetuating environmental and human injustices in the rest of the world, that how our research technologies intended or not are fueling this need for rare earth minerals in uh, for example, looking at the talk um, from Jason Young just before he, now, the Peruvian Amazon displaced
displacing Mahuna indigenous communities. So more again to the idea of the neocolonialism inherent in having these really um, resource intensive data centers. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have very, to be honest, very few thoughts on that at the moment because I'm, I actually just recently was reading about, um, I, I want to try to remember the acronym, um, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, which I think is relatively new, like maybe within the past year that's been creative and other sort of alliances that are um, working towards this issue of data sovereignty, um, which I think is maybe at the center of, uh, uh, of the answer to this question. Um, and so I uh, think organizations like that, um, centers like that, that are sort of built to, um, uh, oh, thank you for putting that in the chat, Robin. So um, putting that, putting sort of the data back uh, where, um, back to the people who contribute that data or who the data belongs to or, um, who uh, created it uh, is an important piece. But again, I um, am honestly just came across that um, group, or that organization, the Alliance, uh, maybe three or four days ago. So uh, I'm still looking into it a little bit more and I'm not really certain of all of the uh, complexities that go into that, uh, especially in thinking about resources. Um, so I'll let you know. Great, thank you, Nagin. And um, there was a suggestion earlier uh, during one of the talks that we try and share more of these resources out. And I had put a link into the chat too, just to our link to a Going Public 2020 research guide where you can learn more about Nagin and our other presenters. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and make that our last question. So thank you so much, Nagin, for that wonderful talk. Incredibly enlightening. And thank you participants for a really engaging discussion and conversation following it. I'm going to go ahead and post some questions in just a minute for us to further reflect on this panel as well as the previous one with um, Jason Young and Chris Coward, as well as for those of you who need to grab some lunch. Uh, we're still going to have another session in a few minutes, but if you would like to um, provide any assessment data on the conference, I will make sure we, we present that as a midpoint um, opportunity as well. Great, great. Thank you, Nagin and Robin. Um, I'm going to 